Okay, thank you. <clears throat> there is actually today uh, a darshan card from the ashram. Did somebody want to read it from that uh, the darshan card? If anybody wanted to. Sure. Yeah. I'll read it. It's opening up. Give me a second. But the <laughs> the message uh, from the ashram on today's darshan day is the best homage that we can render to Shirvindo on his centenary is to have a thirst for progress and to open all our being to the divine influence of which he is the messenger upon the earth. Yes, Prabhupada. And I think that <clears throat> there's another one also after that. Uh, that's from Sri Aurobindo. Okay. There is one. Uh, even more. And next page. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> a spiritual ideal has always been the characteristic idea and aspiration of India. But the progress of time and the need of humanity demand a new orientation and another form of that ideal. Our ideal is not the spirituality that withdraws from life, but the conquest of life by the power of the spirit. It is to accept the world as an effort of manifestation of the divine, but also to transform humanity by a greater effort of manifestation than has yet been accomplished. Okay. <clears throat> so I think uh, Vijay, you can hear me, right? I'm yeah. Coming through. Okay. Uh, please let me know if I need to speak louder. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's such an immense privilege uh, to be speaking to uh, everybody on this occasion, uh, such a special occasion. Uh, of the 150th birth centenary or birth anniversary of uh, Sri Aurobindo. And we all know that Sri Aurobindo is a great man, so one of the greatest men to ever uh, grace the earth. But the thing about Sri Aurobindo is that he is so magnificent, so wonderful and so beautiful in every respect that one is almost tempted to call him the perfect man. Or the one man, at least in my experience, whom I can say I found no imperfection in. And I'm a very critical person and I'm sure most people tend to be very critical. Uh, but when you examine the life of Sri Aurobindo, just like his own, his works, there is such a, such a great abundance, such a huge effusion of riches. And at the same time, it is with combined with so much precise and accurate and very intricately put together forms. The, not just how Sri writes, not just how he wrote all his great works or uh, the poems that he wrote, 
the prose work that he wrote. When we read all of those, it's such an amazing experience of beauty and perfection. But also the way he lived. There's such a great sense that here is a man who is truly as divine as anybody can ever be. From start to finish. We read in our epics of men like Sri Aurobindo, we read of people like Sri Krishna, we read of people like Sri Rama, who are almost the very epitome of perfection. But the great thing about Sri Aurobindo is that he has given us a living example of what a person like that would be. So we can say with some confidence that yes, somebody like Sri Krishna actually existed. And somebody like Sri Rama actually existed. That that's not just a myth, that they are not just creations of somebody's imagination or uh, somebody putting together some epic on paper and saying, yeah, I have just created this character of nothing. No, they are real. You know why? Because Sri Aurobindo is real. And if somebody like Sri Aurobindo can exist, then certainly somebody like Sri Krishna can exist. Somebody like Sri Rama can exist. And this is something that is so remarkable, so wonderful about Sri Aurobindo's life that really sets him apart from practically everybody else. I was just thinking to myself just before we started this uh, Conversation. I'm calling it a conversation, although it's just a monologue right now. <laughs> that about the country of India, about our nation, you know, we are so blessed to be Indians also. Uh, that it is something unique in the sense that India is not merely a country, it is an idea. An idea which has become a country. And what is that idea? That idea is that there is God within everything and there's God within us. That that divinity within us is who we, you and me and everybody else, who we really are. It is that one idea starting from thousands of years back, that one idea that actually became a country over generations and generations of great men. And almost every great man in India, truly great man, has stood for this one idea. Our rishis, our munis, our sages, even the great avatars will come. And in our lifetime also, at least recently, that idea was revived. And it was revived as the soul of India, as the core of India, as the very heart of India by Sri Aurobindo. Because you have always had, at least in the modern mind, a kind of a division between what belongs to the realm of the spirit, let's say, and what belongs to ordinary or material existence. The idea is that if you are a spiritual person, then you have to give up your ordinary material existence. Or if you are somebody who is fully 
into material existence, then you cannot be a spiritual person. This idea was not always there. In the India of ancient times, there was an attempt and there was an understanding that these two apparently divergent or antipodal realities, matter and spirit, were in fact intertwined and one. For example, we see our rishis and munis, they've had uh, you know, families of their own. They had their own material existence. We hear about kings who were, while they were discharging their duties, were also self-realized. And this was the idea that Shri Krishna also sought to revive in the Gita. Because most people have interpreted the Gita to mean that either it is something that is just a form of karma yoga or just a form of bhakti yoga. However, when he is revealing to Arjuna his whole vision, his whole yoga, he says that, you know, Arjun, this yoga that I am declaring to you, this was the same yoga that I had de declared to kings in the past, to Manu, to Ikshwaku. And these kings then would declare the same yoga to other kings. So what he was actually trying to tell Arjuna is that I am trying to revive this tradition specifically for people who are engaged in the world. And not just that, but the very best people. People who are themselves in leadership positions. People who are in positions of responsibility. Leaders and rulers of the world. That this yoga is meant for them. And he uses a very specific word for these people. He calls them Rajarshi. So Rajarshi is somebody who is in a position of a king, but who is also a realized being, a rishi, a seer. And the idea here was that it is the best in humanity that should rule humans. It is the best that should lead humans. And this idea has actually been obscured. It is not something that many commentators of the Gita have brought out. Some have. But it's something that is extremely pregnant with possibilities for the future of India. Because this is the idea that I think will really help India come out of all of this morass that it is caught in. And this is why Sri Aurobindo also spent so much time with the Bhagavad Gita and delved into it with such great depth, at such a great level. For example, it is not very well known, but many some people know that the earliest freedom fighters against the British because we are celebrating Independence Day today, 75th Independence Day today, the earliest freedom fighters, most of them were actually students and sadhaks of the Gita. And behind this also, Sri played a great role and great part. He would actually initiate people into the Gita and tell them about it and teach them, these revolutionaries and these freedom fighters. So even behind our current independence, what we are celebrating today, you find that it is the ancient soul and the ancient spirit of India in the form of the Gita, which was rising. 
And this is something that Shravindo embodied more than anything else, anybody else. Because you had many great sages, many great saints. You had Sri Ramakrishna, you had Swami Vivekananda, who is rightfully very revered. You have you know, Raman Marshi, many others who are in there in the realm of the spirit. You have had some politicians who are great, right? Not many, but a few. But there is only one instance of a person who combined both the characteristics of a great spiritual being as well as a great leader. Only one person. And that is Sri Aurobindo. So he is actually a living example of what such a person looks like. A living example of the ancient type of Indian like Sri Krishna or Sri Rama. And I'm coming back to this idea over and over again because just to emphasize the fact how unique and how special and how magnificent Sri Aurobindo is because nobody else is like this. And it proves to us that this is the way that we can actually help ourselves the best, even in our current situation. And Sri Aurobindo actually talks about it, about what his aims were, what his goals were in life. In that famous uh, uh, five dreams of Sri Aurobindo, the essay that he wrote and then which was read out. And the first of these dreams, of course, was the independence of India. The second was that Asia should re-arise. And the third was of creating a world union. Now, let us look at it. Uh, he gave this vision, let's say, his five dreams in 1947. And today we are at 2022. And how is this held up, right? So let's look at the first dream. The first dream is the independence of India, right? And within that also, he mentioned the reunification of India. Now, as far as we can see, reunifi reunification has not happened. But what has happened is that the forces which wanted to divide India even further have been defeated. So India, which became free in 1947, has withstood the attacks and all of the assaults of the hostile force or forces which want to divide it even further. So it so the current country in the current state of India, the current nation of India, has proven that it has the strength to persist. It has the ability to survive and to prosper. For reunification, this is in fact the first condition. If India itself cannot survive, how will India be reunited? Right? And Shivamdo says that for, for India's continued survival, it is necessary that India should be reunified. But by itself also, India has shown that it has staying power. It has the strength to defend itself and to, to remain strong and resilient in the face of all of these adversaries. Let us look at the second dream. In the second dream, Shrivindu says that it is the dream of an Asia which has re-arisen, reawakened, and thrown the, away the shackles of European domination and imperialism and colonialism. And what is the state today? Very clearly, you can see that we are entering what's called the Asian century. Maybe you're already in it. But all of Asia is as if that part of the world where everything is happening, where there is the maximum amount of growth 
and huge, huge forces at work. If you look at China, we look at Japan, we look at the Southeast Asian countries, look at Korea. They have exploded onto the scene. So you can see already that Shrivindu's second dream also is a major success. Let's look at his third dream. His third dream was that of world union. Now, again, like the reunification of India, it's not something that's apparent on the surface that there has been any kind of world union that has been achieved. However, there is something very remarkable that has happened without any kind of political will behind it, which is that the world has become increasingly smaller and smaller not just because of the transportation, which is so easily available today, not just because of the communication, which is again, so widespread. Even your smartphone, for example, it contributes to this uh, shrinking of the world because it connects you to millions of people you know, immediately. These things were not there just a few decades back, for example. So communication, transportation, even from an economic standpoint, globalization. The world is so increasingly a single global economy that it is hard to say where one nation ends and another one begins. And we can see this actually happening today with Taiwan, where uh, China is extremely angry with Taiwan and would like nothing better than to invade it and take over it. But why doesn't it do it? Because it is tied to Taiwan with many economic ties, which in which its own self-interest lies, but also because it doesn't want to upset other countries like United States, etc., because its own economy depends on all of these other countries. There's no saying it may do something crazy tomorrow, but also there's no denying the fact that it is held back by this interconnectedness of the world. And then finally, we have the greatest, most interconnecting phenomenon, which is the internet. Because of the internet, again, we are so connected to every part of the world, you know, to almost everybody and anybody. And this trend is only increasing as we go forward. So whether there is a political union or not, because of technology, because of economics, because of globalization, this world unity is actually becoming a reality and it's actually becoming a necessity for all countries to be able to survive it. So you can again see that how Shrivindu's third dream is really progressing so magnificently. Which brings us to Shrivindu's fourth dream. And this so far has been my favorite dream. <laughs> because in this dream, Shrivindu talks about India's spiritual gift to the world. And this also has progressed so magnificently since Sri Aurobindo's uh, Mahasamadhi in 1950. Already Sri Aurobindo could see that people were turning to India's spiritual tradition, spiritual wisdom, and spiritual knowledge, spiritual sciences. But now it has become so common, right? Particularly in the US. It is practically at every street corner. And it has become something that everybody is familiar with. And everybody takes up in one way or shape or form, perhaps not in the deepest sense, but even that is everywhere. Only it is not apparent on the surface. There are people everywhere who have turned to, for example, uh, Advait Vedanta which I think has become possibly the most popular philosophical export from any country. And 
everybody is starting to there are many spiritual gurus who are now non indians who have never had anything to do with yoga but who have imbibed this knowledge and who have started to spread it among other people so this dream of shrimp is also exploding so you can already see that we are living in the aurobindonian world we are living in the aurobindonian age because all of these goals all of these visions all of these aspirations let's say that you have had they are all coming true and in such an unstoppable way that there is no way that you can actually put any block or any kind of impediment in the way of this progress and the fourth dream also is most relevant to us because we are not in india we are not in asia and certainly we are not in the business of world union <laughs> but we are in america and our main role in america is to spread the light the wisdom the knowledge and the truth of india not india as a country but india is the greatest of all ideas of the divine in man to spread this is our main job and our main business because many people like to say that you know oh <clears throat> when you go to other countries you have to be ambassadors of india what does that really mean it doesn't mean that you take people out to indian restaurants and make them eat indian food or you know make them see bollywood movies to be ambassadors of india really is to enshrine the soul of india within you sure you may not have realized your soul you don't know what your atma is that's fine <laughs> but the idea is something that you can accept adopt and make the very core of your existence that look the divine is in everything the divine is in me the divine is in you and our job as humans our role the specific function with which we have been designed and put on earth is to find the divine and this is a message that we find over and over and over and over in the works of shravan do it in fact shravan do says it very clearly that what is our objective our objective is the divine Simple. and in that is included everything including the fifth dream which i have not spoken about yet and people know what that fifth dream is of course right and that fifth dream is what makes shivendu the most unique person in the history of spirituality because this idea that the divine is in man the divine is in everything we have to find the divine that is now something that everybody says and that is the goal and the end point of everybody shobindo is the only person who has gone beyond that because shobindo goes and says that there is a further step which is his fifth dream which is that there must be a step in the evolution of humanity and the world and people don't realize that how radical a message this is and what it really does to this whole conception of spirituality because we just read uh, actually vivek ji just read shobindo saying that our ideal is not the spirituality that withdraws from life but the conquest of life by the power of the spirit it is to accept the world as an effort of manifestation of the divine that is so important so important those three words or four words to accept the world this is something that very very few spiritual luminaries can claim to have ever done again this goes back to the ancient indian idea that spirituality and matter are not in conflict they are not 
opposites that they may be on two sides of a single spectrum but they are still connected united and one but even at that time the ancients had little or no idea what this connection was they said sarvam khalu khalu idam brahman you know everything is brahman but why is this sarvam so non brahman like if brahman is sachidar and if he is truth and freedom and consciousness and delight why is it that the world is its very opposite then arose that great mantra what is that great mantra which comes from the upanishad asatoma satgamayam samasoma jyotirgamayam mrityorma amritam gayam so asat tamas and mrityu that is the jagat that is our life as it is today and who we consider ourselves to be as individual jeevas in this world sat jyoti and amritam is that tat is the brahman there was no conception even in the indian mind at that time that the world could be any different than it is today but i don't know of any indian thinker or visionary who was bold enough to go beyond this dichotomy since the time of the vedas till today if anybody knows please let me know because there was the evidence of the senses that look the world when you see it it is exactly made of of all of these things which we say are very negative and very the very opposite almost of the divine and there is the reality of the divine also which seems to be the opposite of the world so even though there was the attempt even in the gita to say that you can be a jivan mukta that you can live in the world as the brahman there was never this idea that the world itself could become an expression of brahman it was always considered a distortion and in that they were right nobody saying that they were wrong even shravanur does not say that they are wrong but he says that there was a level a step a stage a view beyond which is the true reason why spirituality really exists and why matter really exists and that is the manifestation of the divine not a distortion but a direct expression of the divine and here shrivadu brings in that extremely key piece of the puzzle which is evolution and if people are puzzled if people can see me and if they look at me and say why is this guy making his hand like this i'll get to that point because evolution actually has a starting point right when the uh, sun was formed the solar system was formed and the earth was formed this is what science tells us for billions of years the earth was just a lifeless rock and on that lifeless rock after billions of years something changed and you know what that something was it was a very very microscopic invisible little something which nobody would have even noticed and that insignificant insignificant microscopic little nothing became billions and billions and trillions and trillions and countless of microscopic little nothings 
and that situation remained that way for another billions of years many billions of years there was nothing but these small microscopic single cellular organisms billions of years in fact life for the major part of its existence on earth almost for let's say 70 80% and 90% of the time that has been it has been just single cellular organisms billions out of that then emerged multi cellular organisms which became more and more complex and that was there for hundreds of millions of years so if we look at this timeline you already have to be way 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 into the future at a very small point where multi cellular organisms and animals emerge and within that if you look at man he is there just at the tip just at the tip of this huge line of evolution and you see that his appearance is so sudden so recent he's just been around for 200000 years but you look at the complexity of man you look at the variety of powers he possesses the breadth and the depths of which humanity is capable of you compare that to these single cellular organisms or these animals or what there is just no comparison but he comes right at the tip and you know what that tells us it tells us that we are accelerators of evolution we are nature's accelerators of evolution so for all of this time she has been slowly 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 so she is doing almost nothing and at the very end suddenly man appears after billions and billions of billions suddenly man appears and what is the intention what is the goal behind that it is very clear that man represents an acceleration of evolution is a very sudden almost like a spike upwards in consciousness and note that i made a slight change there that man in nature's view appears in an acceleration acceleration meaning nature's run becomes a flight she has been crawling 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 for so long and she learns to walk and then she runs and now she's flying but just at the very end but i had used another word before that which is what sri aurobindo i think brings out beautifully and magnificently that man is not just an acceleration of nature but he is also an accelerator of nature of evolution you i we all of us each human being on the earth has the ability and the conscious choice to willingly deliberately accelerate our own evolution and we can get to the end point of this whole journey which has been going on for billions of years by choosing that this idea was there in seed form in vivekananda's works and shrivendu credits him for that shrivendu never ever hides that he credits swami vivekananda with that and he even says that in alipur jail he heard vivekananda's voice coming to him and talking to him about these very specific uh, spiritual truths about the truth consciousness the supramental etc but this idea was developed and completely made practical and a force in human history by shiv that you are accelerators of evolution if you want to be that starting from the single cell from just dead matter to simplest life forms to more and more complex life forms to now a mental life form there is something beyond that and that is the supra mental life form and this life is the goal of existence 
on earth. This is the goal of life on earth. All life, not us. Any and all life, even matter itself aspires to this. Because this is the divine expressing himself in matter fully, manifesting himself in matter as living beings on earth or in the material plane. And this is what Sri Aurobindo said is the goal of life. But think about this for a moment because so far <clears throat> the ideas that have governed us all basically said that the world is going to end in some kind of a bang or some kind of disaster. You know, the environment is going crazy. Everyone is going to go extinct. Even spirituality has said that there is no hope in the world itself. Our goal is some other place, I'll call it heaven or Goloko, Vaikuntha, anything you want, right? But this earth, but this life, but this sansara, but this jagat, there is no hope here. But this is the hope that Sri Aurobindo has brought. He has completely changed by revealing this totally new way of looking at ourselves, God, a totally new way of looking at the world and of all history, the whole history of life itself. Nobody has done this. The way Sri Aurobindo has done it. There have been people who have got faint inklings of this idea. But nobody has expressed this as fully. Nobody has made it as practical. This is what we mean when we say all life is yoga. That everything that we see, everything that we experience, all of the objects, all the living beings, everything is essentially a yoga of nature trying to find its own divinest form which is the supramental or that level which is beyond just the human or just the mental level. So this is an incredible revolution that nobody except for Sri has brought and that is his fifth dream. And of course the mother knows this more than anybody else. And that's why we have this quote from the mother also today. Right, which is okay. So, this is the let's say the 150th birth anniversary of Shabdu. What do we do on this day? Well, the easiest thing is let's look at what mother did or said, what we should do when she was actually here in her body and she actually declared what we need to do on the 100th birth anniversary, which she considered to be so important. And one of the quotes, because she said several things. So one of the quotes that she has given is exactly what is there today in the Darshan message card. That the best homage that we can render to Sri Aurobindo on his centenary is to have a thirst for progress. Note that she doesn't say that a desire for progress or a wish for progress All of these things are lukewarm. She says a thirst for progress. And what? when does something become a thirst? When it is an absolute need and absolute necessity. And do we really have this thirst? I mean, let's be honest. Few, if anybody has, even in the ashram. And we've heard Mother and Shri say this over and over. Right? That it's very difficult to get people to have this thirst. Here again, we come back to this notion of India. If you look at the whole world, there are billions and billions of people in the world, right? There are tens and hundreds of countries, so many cultures and civilizations. Can you tell me how many civilizations, how many people, how many cultures have discovered the truth of the self. There is only one. Now, this is the highest truth of all existence. This is the highest truth of all humanity. 
the truth of the self, the truth of the inner being. How many cultures and civilizations have only one in all of history? Isn't that remarkable? It's totally amazing. Like you can convince people of science and people can learn all these things, but the deepest and highest truth, it is something extremely rare. So this is how special India is as a country and how unique and how peerless, how sacred a country India is. It is the only country in the world in history of humanity where this truth has been revealed and revealed fully. Again, there have been people who have had glimpses and hints and suggestions and clues, etc. But it's so shocking that nowhere, nowhere else you find this absolute expression of the deepest and highest truth of existence, which has happened only in India, not among the Greeks, not among the Romans, not among the Chinese, not among the Egyptians. People say that they may have had some hints, but there's no evidence to suggest this is how special India is. And that's why even in India also, the people who believe this and know this are rare. Right? They're not very common. Even rarer are people who live for it, which is what the mother is talking about here. Because our normal aspirations, our normal thirsts, Trishna, let us call it, or bhuk, hunger. It is for what? It is for ordinary things. It is for normal things, everyday things, common things that we share with every human being. But this, very few people have. And the magic and the miracle of Mother and Sri is that it's like a planet being in the orbit of the sun. When you're in the orbit of the sun, what happens? You get all the heat from the sun. <laughs> you become hot yourself. You may be a cold, frigid planet, but you'll become hot. So once you come into the orbit of Mother and Sri this thirst begins to grow with you. And before you know it, you're a changed person. I'm sure many people there also can relate to what I'm saying. You know? That you've been in Madan Shavita's orbit for, let's say, five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And you're like, man, I can't recognize that guy who was, or that, that, that person, the woman who I was, uh, you know, 30 years back. I'm mean, I a totally different person. My motives are completely changed. My drive is completely different. And my aspiration is now completely different from all the aspirations that I had once more time. And this is another magic of Adhani Shavindu, that all you have to do, as the mother says in this quote, is to open to them. You know, if you go to other gurus, other saints and sages, they will say, Ke ye karo, wo karo. Hajar ko par karge, uske baad they will give you diksha. You know, there are others who will just give you mantra and say, do this. Many people who will demand a lot of practices and austerities of all kinds. But here, if you have the basic sincerity and you stay in the Robert and you open yourself to them, that magic will work. I'm, I'm saying that this is true in a lot of cases of a lot of other gurus also, but here there is so much direct grace, so much direct force, there's so much direct uh, pull of that divine power which we find nowhere else. It just, it's like a like a white hole, like the we, in science we have a black hole, this is a white hole which sucks you to the light. And that is something that we can all relate to, I'm sure, that once you're in the orbit of Mother and once you have been around Mother and Shvindo, and your life has been filled with them, then automatically from within, you begin to change. Not because of anything you are doing, but because you made the right choice at some point 
and you kept on sticking to that choice that i want badan shivir and this is the one thing that is the only thing i think that's necessary and important that something within us should choose and choose sincerely and stick to this choice there is this line in the savitri that once my heart chose and chooses not again this is the line that savitri says when uh, her parents find out that she has chosen to marry satyavan and that satyavan is actually a person who doesn't have a very happy life ahead of him she says once my heart chose and chooses not again that this final an absolute choice that i belong to madan shivendu i want madan shivendu and this goes back to <laughs> my starting the way i started that shivendu is not just one of the greatest women but it is such a delight as the saying goes in the upanishad raso vaisa he is that rasa embodied you know the divine rasa you know you taste a little bit of shivendu to start with you know like it's almost like you're going into some restaurant and you say chalo dekhte hai yahan pe kya milta hai and uh, say okay can i have some sample and they come and give you something <laughs> you taste a little sample and then wait a minute i've never tasted something so beautiful and delightful and nice oh amazing let me have some more let me have some more and before you know it you're hooked you're addicted to shirovindo you're addicted to mother and that is the real hook that is the real addiction once that starts then you are automatically pulled you are automatically lifted then the work is done for you because then the struggle becomes less i mean struggle still remains there are as mother said that uh, in another place that you know <clears throat> some child which was a quite a common occurrence during these classes they used to ask mother you know how do we find the truth and how do we get knowledge so mother said that you have to aspire 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 and you have to knock 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 on the door you have to be very persistent and one day suddenly everything opens up and she said that this is an image this is symbol but basically what she means is that you should want this there should be this thirst and you should continuously persistently keep going back to it and wanting more wanting more wanting more because we want more of everything else but the divine but imagine if we wanted more and more of the divine itself that would be the greatest salvation for all of us for each of us so this is the joy this is the magic this is the beauty of shivendu i mean we could go on talking about shivendu for ages right it's an inexhaustible reservoir of wonders and beautiful magnificent treasures right but once you have a taste and you get hooked and you're addicted you want more of shivendu you want more of the mother ultimately you can't live without that then you have really come to a point where the heavens have opened up for you not just the heavens above but the heavens below on earth right and this is something that we do not just for ourselves although there is a great sincerity in doing it for yourself right when you say ki main to apne liye kar raha hu because i love shiv and i love mother there is a great sincerity in that right you're not like making a big show oh, oh, i'm some noble great guy no i'm just an ordinary guy who really has fallen in love with somebody and that's it but there is another angle and that angle is that we have to do it for the world we have to do it for everybody because this is the one thing that the world needs because everywhere there is only ignorance there is only falsehood there is only inconscience and there is this harmony everywhere it is like things crashing into each other falling against each other and all kinds of conflicts and all kinds of unnecessary suffering unnecessary suffering and it's just going on and on on with life after life you know people build their magnificent lives saying oh i have billions of dollars i have so much property i have great family i have you know sons and daughters you know 
in so many different parts of the world. But you know, one small thing that you never planned on will come and destroy everything. You thought that, oh, I've come to America, now I've got a green card, now I've got a nice job, I've got money in the bank, I've got a nice home, I've got property, I've got cars, I've got investments, I've got kids who are well settled. One small thing will come and your life will be gone. Your happiness is gone. It is like it is with nothing. This is the sad reality of every human existence. From Jeff Bezos and all the billionaires to the poorest beggar in the street. It's all basically a show. It's all a false assurance. I've built this fortress of objects and things and possessions. It's going to protect me. No, one small little pin prick will bring the whole thing down. And it's going to. And this is the best, this, I'm, I'm describing the best scenario for you. Many humans go through suffering only throughout their life. Why? Because we are trapped in our own ego consciousness. Why? Because we are ignorant in the spiritual sense. We don't know who we are truly. We are the divine. If you are the divine, you have no suffering, you have no fear. So this is the work that needs to be done for all of humanity. Why we behave like such animals and monsters to each other and to ourselves. Because we have not risen to that level of consciousness where we can be divine and bring divinity into the rest of the world. This is the work to be done. And this is what the Mother and Shivindo are here to do for us and through us and for the world. And this is why we have our center. This is why we are here today. This is why we are also on this path. So that we can truly make this world a divine world. We can truly express the divine will. Which is what Mother and Shivendra were. They were the, the concrete materialization of the divine will. Like nobody else. Because what is the divine will? The divine will is to make a divine world. And this is what Madan and are trying to do. And this is what Shrivindu represents. And this is why he will be greater and greater and greater as time goes by. His, his splendor will grow like an ever rising sun. A sun that never sets, but just keeps getting rising higher and higher becomes brighter and brighter. That is going to be sure. And people are going to look back and they're going to wonder, you know, how did such a man come? How is it possible such a divine being walked the earth? And that is our great privilege that we are already at that place where we have a sense of how wonderful and beautiful and blessed we are. To just know about Shrivindu. The very sound of 15th of August. When I say 15th of August, doesn't it sound beautiful? When I say August 15th, August 15th, doesn't it sound beautiful? What does that say? It shows that you already know the significance of what is August 15th. You already know what Shrivindu is. You have an idea and you have begun to become that complete lover of Shrivindu, right? That's why when I say August 15th, just the word August 15th sounds so great. Right, And that is why we are all so blessed and so lucky and so fortunate. And let us try in whatever smallest of ways we can. We are all humans. We are all imperfect. We are all full of all kinds of things. Let us try in our own little way to become what Mother and Shivindu want us to be. Let us try to aspire. Aspire to them. And be completely hooked to them. Mahashrivindu. Just, just Mother and Shrivindu. That's it. Because I'm telling you truly, in the whole spiritual history of humanity, there's nothing that comes close to Mother Shrivindu. And to find Mother Shrivindu is the greatest thing, really. And we are all so fortunate. And so let us be really happy about it.
थैंक यू गोविंद जी मेडिटेशन में भी है ना